my fellow panelists to join me up here. I'm Dan Rundy. I hold the Schreier Chair here at CSIS. <clears throat> uh, we're going to be having a conversation today about facing complex challenges, innovating through integrated development. We are also releasing a paper. Um, it has my name on it, but I really owe it to my colleague Christina Perkins, who's in the back, as well as uh, Julie Snyder uh, for all their hard work. So thank you both for they really deserve most of the credit uh, for the paper. We're very pleased with it, and I think that uh, uh, I think it's very interesting. We wanted <clears throat> there are oftentimes a lot of fads in international development, uh, and I think you have to take advantage of the fact that there's fads to actually there's truth and there's fad, and you should take advantage of these moments when there's exuberance about a topic, and I think there's a, some exuberance about the issue of integrated development, and there's a lot of truth to integrated development. There are a lot of challenges about achieving integrated development, and we're going to talk about all of that today. Um, I'm going to give you our version of, an, of what does integrated development mean, and I'm going to ask each of the panelists also, we're going to have a, we'll have a conversation, I think we'll unpack the, the concept of integrated development, but Integrated development is a process that seeks to link the design, delivery, and evaluation of projects across different sectors. Many practitioners believe that by achieving greater integration, donors can maximize the intended development outcomes by seeking to address more than one simple problem through a discrete intervention. But however, I think for those of you who actually are in the development business, if you look at the 150 account, which is the account that, that the, where the money comes from for foreign assistance, if we just think in the US context or in many other uh, aid agency contexts, people think in terms of silos, they think in terms of their specific sector, uh, and so it, in the way in which the co US Congress thinks about uh, development, thinks about it by, I'll use the term flavor of money, in terms of flavors of money or sectors. So, so integrated development is great in theory. How actually achievable is it in practice with a whole number of different sorts of organizational funding, budgeting, planning, and, and, and mental models about what, what theory of, one's theory of change looks like? I think that those, are, I think, are some of, the, I think some of the core issues that we're going to get at. I think we've got a great panel, uh, very thoughtful people. I don't think need much of an introduction, but I'll just quickly just go down the, 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 um, the, the seats here and, and briefly introduce them. Uh, but then I'll, I'm going to turn it over to my friend Patrick Fine. I want to make one other point, which is to thank FHI 360 uh, for supporting the, uh, this event, but also uh, the work of the paper as well. So thank you, Patrick, and thanks FHI 360. So Patrick Fine, who is the CEO of FHI 360, and then Carla Capel, who's uh, of late, recently from USAID, but is now at the US Institute of Peace. Thanks for coming over. We have a nice building too, so we're very <laughs> <laughs> uh, Ambassador Don Steinberg, who's the CEO of World Learning, and also formerly of, of uh, USAID and the State Department. Thanks for being here, former Ambassador Angola. My friend Diana Olbaum, who's a senior advisor here at CSIS and known to all of us uh, as, a, as an innovator and, a, and a, someone who really has worked for international development on the Hill for a long time. Thanks for being here. And then our friend Susan Reichley, counselor to the administrator. Uh, a very distinguished Foreign Service officer and doing very, very important work at Aiden. Thanks for taking time out of your busy schedule to be here. We really appreciate it. So Patrick, integrated development. Uh, there's a reason you, if FHI 360 feels strongly about it. Why is FHI 360 believe in integrated development? Uh, thanks, Dan. Um, first, it's really a privilege to be with a panel that's as distinguished as this one and also a privilege to be with an audience as distinguished as this one. <laughs> so I'm sure we're gonna have a great discussion today. Um, I'll start with two observations that I, I don't think are controversial. I hope they may be a little provocative. The first is that some of our most successful development efforts have been single sector focused interventions. The Green Revolution focused on crop science to produce new high yield grains. And PEPFAR, which is the most successful initiative in our generation, focused on a single disease. Uh, both examples address a pressing issue of the day, hunger in the case of the Green Revolution, pandemic disease in the case of PEPFAR. They were both grounded in natural science, and so it was possible in both cases to have rigorous measures and to report against metrics. Um, so you had compelling causes, with reliable short-term metrics that created the justification for policymakers uh, and for the public 
to sustain these efforts with large amounts of money, with big funding over a long period of time. So a reasonable question is if single sector programs are so uh, successful, if they're easier to measure and to explain, and they produce good results, why are we talking about more difficult to measure, more difficult to manage integrated development? And that leads me to my second observation. We live in a world of rapid change. Uh, today's economic, technological, and demographic shifts are giving rise to human development challenges that cut across sectors and disciplines and in turn require more sophisticated solutions that take account of complex interde interdependencies um, and the need for more integrated approaches. Um, Dan, your paper was a great paper. If you, if you haven't read the paper that CSIS has done, it's a really good treatment of the issue and it, it, it really exposes the, the questions um, and the dynamics uh, around integrating approaches. Um, and as your paper points out, holistic approaches aren't new. Uh, but we believe that the degree of interconnectedness in the world today and the pace of change is different than it was in the past. And if you look at the global development agenda that's embodied in the SDGs, you see this explicit recognition of the changed environment and an explicit recognition that, that that new environment calls for new approaches and in particular for having integrated approaches as part of that agenda. Um, we've been working to adapt our practices to new realities. Um, and I can tell you from our perspective, it, it's not our experience, it's not easy to do. Um, now, there is a growing consensus around the rationale for integrated programs. Um, and it's best embodied if you, in the SDGs. Yep. Um, but we don't yet have the institutional mindset or the tools to fully enable integrated programs. So I, I'm going to close with a couple of things that I think we can do to enable 21st century program design and execution. Because when we talk about integration, we're really talking at an operational level around program design and program execution and evaluation. So first, I would say put more time into program design. Uh, require in-depth root cause analyses and build in and finance rigorous formative evaluations so we can customize efforts to the context in which people live. And that, we, we shorthand that by, by calling for people-centered design. But um, I, I think what all of us mm -hmm. have probably learned through our experience is if the design's not right, the program's not gonna succeed. So put more effort up front, that's one. Two is shift our emphasis on accountability from counting inputs to counting outcomes. So right now, accountability, which really uh, conditions behave, people's behavior. It incentivizes and disincentivizes the way institutions behave and the way individuals behave. And it's all about counting inputs and maybe outputs, but it's really not focused on outcomes. And until you get it focused on outcomes, you're not going to be able to, to have the kind of agile implementation um, or, to, or to devise new ways of measuring results. Finally, um, we need new tools, or we need to adapt the tools we have to support 21st century program design and delivery to enable us to use evidence-based integrated approaches. So these are things like providing authority, and Diana, maybe you can talk to this, providing authority to actually design integrated approaches to achieve a uh, a focused initiative objective. So you can have an objective like Feed the Future that's, that's quite focused and approach it in integrated fashions. But right now, because of the way the authorities work in our appropriations law, there are real challenges um, to doing that. So um, give people the authority to design integrated programs. Um, adapt our, our instruments, our grants and our contract instruments, our partnership instruments, 
um, in ways that allow for integrated agile development. I think we have the tools, we just don't use them in, in, in the way that would enable more agile development. And we should work on new tools for measuring progress that, um, that look at outcomes. So those are some practical steps that I think will enable integrated approaches. It's all about, ultimately, about managing change. Change is tough. And I feel like we're always playing catch up. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. So better design, count outcomes, and new authorities. Right. OK. Carla, thanks for being here. Um, you deal with conflict and humanitarian crisis. How does, how does integrated development, how does that come into play in the context of conflict? Great. Well, first of all, thank you for having me. And I guess I'm sort of too brained on this stage, <laughs> having transferred less than two weeks ago. Um, but when you asked me to have this conversation, the first thing that occurred to me were two very brief anecdotes. One was I was in visiting Cambodia, and I went to visit a program that was a health program and was talking to beneficiaries from that health program who were dealing with uh, family planning, particularly, and HIV AIDS transmission. And all I kept thinking as I sat there and they were going through the motions of the work that they were doing in the program was, what a missed opportunity to do more. You know, you had these beneficiaries that were engaged in a program that was so narrowly focused when that's not the way their lives worked, that wasn't the way even their attention to health worked. We weren't really building out from there into a broader conversation, and it was a, a really missed opportunity. Fast forward to um, Uganda, uh, and I went to visit a couple of projects in the, in the north, in the conflict, previously conflict-affected states, and there were these programs which were uh, multifaceted and multi-sectoral, and I went to visit them, and it felt much, much more rewarding. They were dealing with families and communities mm -hmm. where they lived. They were focused on food security, nutrition, uh, economic well-being and livelihoods, and they're working across that, uh, those divides of sectors. Um, and then I um, visited the one community. I thought this was a really interesting project. F next day, visit another community, and whereas the first community had f five themes that they were working on. The second community from a different sector had seven themes that they were working on, and they had a little rhyme that they told for their five versus their seven, and there was, <laughs> but they were basically integrated projects doing very similar things that looked very alike, and I think it brought forward some of the challenges, Patrick, that you are highlighting. So now I sit at USIP, and I layer on top of that this fragile and conflict-affected setting, and I think back to both the experiences of Uganda and Cambodia, and I say, wow, we have another layer of complexity that we need to put into the discussion of integrated development. What does that mean? Well, we know that the number, the duration, and the intensity of crises and conflicts is increasing in countries mm -hmm. around the world. Yeah. Last year, we had... Um, a combined level of effort in responding to emergencies that was never before seen, and none of those conflict and those crises have, uh, have abated and resolved in the intervening year. Uh, we have a situation in which, whereas disaster assistance response teams, and I saw Tom's here, so uh, DACHA's responses used to look at six months to a year, and then they would move on. Now we're looking in Syria at six years. Oh. And, we, uh, and we know that that situation isn't going to shift. And, um, and we look at countries like uh, South Sudan, where we have a waxing and waning, but we uh, haven't been able to get out of those cycles. And that has real implications, not only for the way we do development, um, but also for what foreign aid-assisted countries look like, and how that set of countries um, arrays itself in terms of the kinds of interventions you can undertake, and can be success and can successfully undertake, and the durability of the results that you achieve. And so when I think about what the implications of that are for the framework that um, Patrick has laid out for us, I think it translates to a number of things that we need to factor into any conversation about integration. 
Uh, the first is that integration also needs to anticipate and think about the potential or real need to work across humanitarian assistance and long-term development, and how that translates into the operating environment and the programs and projects we put on the, design, uh, on the ground, and in turn, how we design those and how we monitor them for results. I think the second is we need to bear in mind the operating environment. Uh, because it has very real consequences for the way we move projects out into the field and then how we staff them, how we fund them, and how we look at the different phases in the conflict and the project life cycle um, and take stock and promote a learning agenda. I think the third is we need to think about the types of expertise. Uh, that we put in projects and how we staff them up. Because there are very real implications for who needs to be on the ground to operate and integrate a program that is in a kinetic environment, one that's in a fragile environment, and one that's in a stable developing country that's on a trajectory that is peaceful and prosperous moving forward. And then I think the last thing, or one of the last things we need to bear in mind is also the time frame and the analysis and the metrics that we apply for success. Uh, because at the end of the day, the operating environments we work in will have very profound implications for how we, um, how we look at the results we can expect to achieve and whether we're achieving those results. And I think that that has very important implications for then what we see as the prospect and the hope for integrated interventions versus those that are sector specific and projectized. Okay, great, thank you. Don, thanks for being here. That was, that, that's a tough act to follow, Don. <laughs> so, Don, thanks for being here. I know sure. there's a, you, you are thinking about this in your new life, newish life at, at World Learning. Absolutely. But I know you also had to think about this in several of your past lives, both at aid and as an ambassador as well, thinking about integrating across different sectors. So sure. thanks for being here. So thank you. I, I often think I'm invited as the uh, token cockeyed optimist in, in this setting, and I will not disappoint today. Uh, and thank you for the excellent paper that thank you prepared. You. It really was, uh, was, was fabulous. I'm indeed speaking today as the head of world learning. And for those of you who do not know, we have been an academic uh, and educational and exchange institution for some 80 years. Uh, working with high school kids, with college kids, with graduate students. But more recently, we have become a global NGO, and we have about uh, 60 projects we're doing in 35 countries, a pipeline of about 250 million. And some of the types of projects we're doing, we're training 90,000 teachers in Pakistan Amazing. to build a literacy system that's open to girls, that's quality and that can compete with the madrasas. We're in Lebanon working with hundreds of communities impacted by Syrian refugees. We're doing STEM education in high schools in Egypt, and especially for girls. We're forming the higher education system in Kosovo. And we're also doing capacity building in countries like Myanmar and Malawi and Ethiopia. The basic theory of change at World Learning aligns perfectly with integrated development. And as I read your paper, I said, this is what we, we do on a daily basis. We work in capacity building and education, but we also recognize that in order to do that, you have to both draw on and enhance a whole variety of other aspects. And one is local ownership under the concept, nothing about them without them. Mm. There's a need for economic growth. If you're gonna proceed in this area, you have to engage previously marginalized groups, women, people with disability, the LGBT community. You need to incorporate science and technology in everything you do. And partnerships is the name of the game. And by definition, all of those factors force you out of that one single approach on food security on energy. Not to revisit a political debate from 20 years ago, but indeed it does take a village in this space. Uh, so how does this implement, uh, affect the implementation of, uh, of projects like ours, which are largely uh, funded by the US government? Uh, I wanted to make three points, and they're very similar to the points that have been made so far. 
First, you need a prior uh, agreement and consensus on goals. You have to have this reflect not just the narrow criteria of the agreement, but the broader development uh, area. And indeed, you need to embrace, as Patrick was saying, concrete, time-bound, measurable goals and accountability provisions. You have to focus on outcomes, as he said, not just output and, and inputs. But I also believe that you need feedback loops mm -hmm. because you're gonna find that your project is going off in the wrong direction constantly and you need your aid officer to say it is okay to adapt the program, to take resources that were promoting a different part of your project and reflect the changes that have occurred in that area. The other thing we need to do, and I think Patrick and, uh, and Carla both referred to this, is to better measure soft targets. Because we're pretty good at those hard targets, but how do you measure you know, gender empowerment? And how do you measure capacity building? And we've taken some good steps. Uh, Karen Grohn and uh, Ruth Levine have adopted uh, a number of excellent metrics in that space, uh, including the uh, Women's Agricultural Empowerment Index. But we still need to get better on that. Secondly, quite simply, integrated development requires a focus on resiliency, on flexibility of response, and open communications between implementers and funders. And so even as we focus on how many girls are in school or how much power have we generated, we need to remember that our real purpose is a holistic improvement in the socioeconomic well-being of our target audiences. Finally, as you say in your paper, this isn't new. We did this in the 1970s and 1980s, and I got a real sense of deja vu when I read your description of the Senegal Feed the Future program. You know, I am today celebrating my 40th anniversary of entering the development field. Uh, I know I don't look today. Old. Happy birthday. Today. As a child <laughs> prodigy. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I was. Uh, and my first tour with the U.S. government was in the Central African Republic. Mm -hmm. And I was asked to implement a rural health program in a province out in the middle of nothing. And we were asked to focus on two very narrow goals. One was maternal mortality and one was child mortality. Mm -hmm. And so at the age of 22, I wander in there and I say, great, let's build a big health facility and let's bring in doctors and nurses. And then I went to the marketplace and talked to the women in that country and in that province. And they said, we don't need that. You know, what we need are health huts with basic medicines. We need weight monitoring to identify problems with child development. We need supplemental feeding programs for lactating and pregnant women. We need to expand the protein in our diet which is based on manioc. We need clean water to, uh, to address gastrointestinal problems, and we need you to train midwives. And so as you think about that, the, our goal was not any of that. Our goal was to reduce child and maternal mortality. And yet we brought in Peace Corps volunteers who dug wells and then trained the people in how to keep those boreholes working. They did fish culture programs, which succeeded dramatically. They, WHO brought in midwives to train midwives on the ground. UNDP recognized that you couldn't buy medicines for those health huts without income generating projects. You know, we recognize that basic literacy, especially for girls, was essential to, to all of this. Two years later, I left the Central African Republic and you could already see a measurable decline in those two indicators that we were talking about. But more importantly, you could see a, a country and a province moving ahead. And let me say, I was hooked on integrated development from that moment on. And again, for the last 40 years, I'm delighted to see that we're moving now back to the future. So, <laughs> so Diana, I, I 
I consider you an optimist in general, so I'm going to just I'll start with that because I know you have had a you had to deal with a lot of difficult challenges in your past life on the hill. So I think, so I know, I I, I think that this topic though is hard in our political environment, and I think it's important that we we manage expectations because I think impl on a on an imp on a, at the field level it sounds as if there are a lot of successes that there are there are. Uh, many positive examples, but it, it seems as if maybe perhaps it's in spite of our system as opposed to in, with the system working to support this. Thanks, Dan. Well, if um, Don is going to be the cockeyed optimist, I guess that makes me the skunk at the garden. <laughs> 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 because there are a lot of challenges, and I think you know we need to understand them to understand why we're even having this conversation, because it's not as easy as, as it sounds. And it's, it's really not just um, a matter of different specializations, different cultures, different ways of looking at things, but different funding streams. And by that, I, I actually mean what a normal person would call earmarks. Um, <laughs> so um, most foreign assistance is subject to some kind of earmark or spending directive that are, are, are very specific about what it can be used for and um, it, it makes it very difficult to use it for something else. And I just you know, printed out the list of some of the sector allocations um, from this year's appropriations bill. And I mean, it just goes on and on. You know, it starts out with basic education, 800 million. Higher education, 225 million. Biodiversity conservation, 265 million. And it goes on with wildlife trafficking, food security and agricultural development, microenterprise and microfinance, trafficking in persons, reconciliation programs, water and sanitation. Then there's about 10 more under environment programs. And these are, these are the sectors that go across the different accounts. And then within each account, like development assistance or global health, there are a list of, of I mean, they're, they're technically they're not earmarks, but in, for all practical purposes, they are. So if you look at global health programs, <coughs> maternal and child health, polio, Gavi Alliance, nutrition, micronutrients, vitamin A, iodine deficiency disorder, vulnerable children, blind children, HIV AIDS, micro, microbicides, global fund, UNAs, I mean, I'm just starting down this list, okay? So if you're USAID and you have to try to piece this together, it is pretty darn difficult to do an integrated program. And um, I have to say it's not entirely new. <coughs> the Foreign Assistance Act um, used to have accounts by sector. They were merged at one point mm -hmm. into development assistance and then child survival was taken out and then that you know evolved into global health. So it's, it's not entirely new, but I think the number of earmarks and the specificity of them and the bindingness of them has gotten had much worse over time. Um, but it's, they're not there just because you know Congress wants to ruin foreign aid. I mean, there, there actually is a rationale behind some of this, and so I'll try quickly Please. to just run through some of it. I mean, the first one is that foreign aid is not popular. I mean, people just, that's the one thing in the budget that everybody wants to cut, and, and if you, pitch it in terms of things that people like. They like girls' education. You know, they like water and sanitation. If you, if you can put it in a, in a, in a terminology or a, a sector that has some popular appeal, you build support for the whole program. The second thing is that there's actually no natural constituency for foreign aid. The people who benefit live overseas and do not vote. So the real the constituents are primarily NGOs here in the U.S. And so many of them, and I bet a bunch of you sitting in this room here, have gone up to Capitol Hill to lobby for specific allocations, earmarks, no way. whatever. I don't believe it. I don't, <laughs> Diana. Not, I don't believe it. There's not a single I'm person in this room that's ever done that. I don't believe it. Uh, no, no, no. So when I'm shocked. <laughs> shocked. There's gambling going on in this Absolutely. casino. So we end up with this system where you know there's all these these line items, um, and that um, has ended up kind of creating this vicious cycle with a lack of trust between the administration and Congress, where Congress puts into 
uh, law, what it wants to see done. The administration has different ideas. They try to do it their way. Then Congress gets more angry that they didn't do it the way Congress wanted to. And you get this, this terrible cycle. And I think there's nowhere more that the, um, evident of this lack of uh, trust than in the area of family planning. And when you talk about integrated development, what many Republicans on Capitol hear is abortion. What they hear and is I, 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 I Patrick's swear to, face on camera. <laughs> wow. Okay. So what they hear is you're trying to wiggle out of the walls that we put around family planning to make sure that you don't take money from other accounts and use it that way, or you don't find some notwithstanding language and use that as an excuse to, to, to fund abortion somehow. That's really what a lot of them hear. So you have to be very careful with the terminology. Um, so in addition to these purely kind of political challenges, there are a couple of conceptual challenges that I, I just wanted to take a second to raise. The first is, even though we're only beginning to come up to the idea of evaluations and having serious um, accountability and programs, it becomes much more difficult to do an evaluation when you have multiple goals. So if you have... Um, you know, an education program, and then you take advantage of that, uh, you know, teaching program to put health information in the, in the school book, mm -hmm. let's say. You know, do you test it by whether they've had improved health outcomes or improved education outcomes? It makes it much more difficult. The second is that the evidence base is, um, is still fairly weak for integrated development. I have to say, if you want to see the ultimate in integrated development, look at Millennium Villages. So this was an experiment, you know, by Jeff Sachs to take a whole village, you know, in Africa and do everything they need at once, the education, the health, the water, the, the whole nine yards, and, and take, and, and instead of having one-off programs. And honestly, you know, that's regarded as sort of an expensive... Um, There's a book. Okay. There's a book, right, The Idealist, which is about, about his experiment. So they didn't... It's not well regarded. Okay, they didn't, they didn't create any controls. Book, no. Great book. There's no, there's no counterfactual. So you can't tell whether the gains that they made would have been achieved anyway, even if they hadn't done it in that way. So the best you can say for it is that there's no proof that it worked. Um, finally, I'll just say, I think that there's a lack of understanding, and even in myself, I will say, of the difference between integration and coordination. Mm -hmm. So do you need to actually do all the various sectors and, 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 and problems within one activity or one program? Or can you do a bunch of different things with different money, with different programs, and coordinate them and make sure that they're all um, aware of and, and, and you know, coordinated with each other? So. Thank you, Diana. You're a truth teller, and I appreciate you skunking. being here. And I'm, that is one of the reasons we're so thrilled you're part of the CSI's family. Thank you, Thank you. for being here. Susan, thanks for being here. Um, so some, some good news, some challenges, uh, typical of just being in development. There's some good and there's some hard. So how, how, are you, how is AID thinking about this, this concept of integrated development? Great. Well, thanks, Dan. Thanks for having me. And it's just great to be here with former colleagues. It's, uh, it's like coming home week. So mm -hmm. it's sort of a discussion we would have when we're all sitting together. Yes. And, and hopefully you guys will get involved really soon. I guess, you know, I really wanted to be here this afternoon because I, for many of the reasons that my colleagues have said, I mean, this is not a new issue at all. It is back to the future, as Todd said. Um, and yet, as Patrick defined in the paper, is really outstanding. It, it, it brings us up to sort of today world and why we think um, you know it's so important right now in the past and many I see many former colleagues out here as well we called it cross-sectoral programming right I mean in the oh, 90s yeah. mm -hmm. we had then yeah. strategic objective teams where we all came together and brought different sectoral teams together to to try and really integrate and integration is different from coordination, as Diana's pointing out, in order to achieve, most importantly, the development result that they, we all expected. So just a couple things um, I heard uh, them say, and I, I want to kind of reiterate, and then uh, really get into the political and the conceptual issues. Uh, you know, again, not only what has it been around our agency for some time, I think one of the things that has been different under this administration, and I really do credit uh, Don Steinberg, who was our deputy administrator, and he was 
was basically in charge of uh, making sure all the policies that came out of our new Policy Planning and Learning Bureau really, um, really fit the bill. And in this case, you know, on so many levels, mm -hmm. from our policy framework to our ge gender policy, which Carla, you know, obviously helped launch, to our biodiversity policy, I could go through every policy. Integration is core to that. And why? Because we know in order to really achieve development results, all of us, this isn't just a USAID issue, that being able to bring more forces to the table to really look at it through an integrated lens, because that's how community members look at it. They don't look at it as just a family planning issue or an ag issue or a governance issue. They're dealing with all issues, and not just at the local level, whether you're sitting down with a governor or a mayor or, or somebody in the private sector who's uh, about to invest. Um, and obviously, this is important for sustainability. I mean, another reason why all of us care so deeply about this. And you know, as Don and many people around the table who participated in Busan really led the charge, it's important to the international community, as we know. And as Patrick said, um, you know, with the SDGs, you know, what we've learned. I think Carla just ra you know touched on that so beautifully by giving some examples from the field. And when she talked about Uganda and northern Uganda, many of you know some of the projects there. Are, it's an integrated approach. Well, that's where leadership really matters. That happened because it was built into the country mm -hmm. strategy. It was built into the project mm -hmm. design, as all my mm -hmm. colleagues were yeah. saying. When you have it built in from the beginning, it's so much easier to be able to achieve those results. And leadership matters. In that case, we have outstanding leadership and still do at our, our USAID mission in Uganda. Uh, and we, there was a AAAS fellow who actually, her job in the mission was to be the integrated expert. She was the one who was trying to get people from different sectors to talk to each other. And so one of the challenges we have to talk about today, I think, is just the cost of integration. Um, Diana did such a beautiful job of talking about, obviously, the challenges with the earmarks, the political, the conceptual. But one of the things, and for our partners, and, and I know our partners could talk about this really easily, you know, it's a time cost. It's a resource, and you have to have. So in Uganda, in Ethiopia, in Rwanda, where the leadership team made the decision, we are going to have staff that their job is to integrate. They are going to get the ag people to talk to the climate people, to talk to the health people, mm -hmm. to talk to the education people. And you know, we're very fortunate at USAID right now to have our administrator, Gail Smith, who um, almost every day talks about the cylinders of excellence and how do we break those cylinders <laughs> down. Many of you have heard that yes. um, before. We also have to be intentional. I mean, I think Patrick and Don obviously both talked about that. How do we actually you know, map it out, not just in geographic terms, but really understand understanding what's on the ground and and as Don really highlighted so beautifully the importance of feedback loops. Well, feedback loops requires adaptability and many of you who are partners know if it's not built into not only the strategy and the mm -hmm. design but actually into your contract and your agreement that guess what partners you're going to yeah. share work plans you're going to co-locate in the same geographic region. That, that adaptability and then being able to uh, build it into the, not only the procurement system, but just how we work on a daily basis. Uh, I put out there as well challenges we have to talk about risk taking because there are going to be failures and it's going to be difficult to measure you know, the impact as, as Diana was saying, how do you actually tease out that integrated approach really um, created a result. One of the things I'm so glad our DACHA colleagues are here because they, led by Tom and Lisa and the whole team, have really worked on the political economy analysis. It's really easy, as we know, when you're focused on health outcomes or outputs or education, you're focused on your technical area. But understanding the broader political economy is, is absolutely uh, essential. So what do we need to do? And I'm just going to close with a couple of these things. Um, internally, one of the things that we've identified, no, we know we need to do is we need to be providing much clearer guidance on this. So we've been talking about this for decades, but we've actually never issued guidance which, as my colleagues knows, that's our doctrine, and that's how we get things done. Uh, we need to incentivize, as we were talking about, and not just incentivize internally through awards and promotions and things like that, but uh, obviously with our partners and with our other mm -hmm. donors. What, what incentivizes all of you? What incentivizes all of us in the international community to put our time uh, into this? We've also uh, learned that having uh, innovation funds works. 
Uh, again, applause to our DRG colleagues, uh, as well as our biodiversity colleagues, who have created separate innovation funds for integration. And that has led to, um, to results that we can talk about. Externally, you know, we need to encourage more collaboration and less competition. And I know that that's really mm -hmm. tough. Um, it's, you know, there are limited resources, but how we can build that in. As far as the earmarks, uh, I think Diana is absolutely right. I mean, obviously, that's how we're set up. But um, to maybe be a bit of the optimist, as I always <laughs> try and look at that glass half full, <laughs> I've been really pleased at, you know, looking at how sitting down with a hill, and I'll give a concrete mm. example. Um, uh, obviously with a water earmark, which has been around for some time. And we always thought that there was sort of an 80-20 split and that we had to do things a certain way. You know, having people, and this is where it's really advantageous to have people come from the administration, the Hill, and externally. We sat down and we talked about that. And actually people who had come from the Hill as staffers into the administration said, no, let's sit down, let's have the dialogue. So if we even look at the Kiwash project, just to highlight that one, in Kenya, which has you know, very much directed WASH funding uh, for that project, but it also has uh, the earmark of Feed the Future and being able to work on devolving the, the, the capability and the capacity of water programs out to the municipal level. That was an example of using two earmarks to achieve an objective. So I think we can do it. Mm -hmm. We just really have to be very intentional and um, work together. So many other issues to talk about, but I'll stop okay. here because I know Thank we want to get in discussion. So let me, I want to ask um, Patrick, Carla, and Don to respond to this issue of, of earmarks. I'm sure no one, of, none of you have ever gone up to the hill and, and, and done any of that, but I would just say, how do, you, how do you respond to the issue of earmarks? And how, is sort of one question. I think the other question I'd like the three of you to think about is what are the, what would the, you know, I think people, you know, amateurs I think talk about policy, I think professionals talk about contracting. So could we talk a little bit about what would the procurement, what would be some adjustments in procurement look like to actually make this real? Because I think to the agency's credit, there's been these broad agency announcements, which I think is a great innovation mm -hmm. in procurement. I'm looking for an opportunity to, to do something on that, uh, maybe around the innovation lab at sometime soon here at CSIS. But I'm interested, I think that's one modality mm -hmm. by which I think that kind of helps force sort of into talking across silos. So. I, Patrick, why don't I start with you? So for, uh, one question is the issue of earmarks. And another question is, okay, tell me about what, what kinds of procurement, procurement instrumentalities or approaches just from given where you are now. Yeah, so I look at it from a very pragmatic point of view. I think that with earmarks, the obstacles you laid out are absolutely there. But I think that it's possible if we could um, get into a dialogue with uh, with Congress around the authorities that you can, you can retain the emphasis on specific objectives, but, but allow, but if the evidence shows that the best way to achieve that objective is through a, maybe through another sector, then authorize the ability to do that. And I'll give an example. There's evidence that shows that for each year a girl in, sub in Southern Africa spends in secondary school. For each additional year in secondary school, her, her um, chance of, of getting infected with HIV decreases by 8%. So if you're saying, if our objective is to decrease the incidence of HIV in adolescent girls, then one of the best strategies might be to to take actions that get more of them into school. But when we've approached, when we've suggested, hey, if you want to reduce HIV incidence, we should be looking at school fees in secondary school for adolescent girls and working with the government to reduce that obstacle to, to girls' participation in secondary school. The, res the answer we get is, well, that's an education uh, intervention, so we can't use PEPFAR money for an education thing. So that would be an example where an integrated approach doesn't change the objective you're trying to get. It's based, you're using an evidence base and you're saying the evidence tells us that a good way of, a, of solving this problem is not through a biomedical health uh, path, but through, in this case, an education path. 
And talking to colleagues, there are many examples of that where you're not, you're not trying to, to, to you know, sneak out of, of um, the Congress's directives to prioritize certain actions. You're just, you're just seeking the authority to approach them in more holistic and more innovative ways. And, and you base it on evidence so that you've got a strong justification. On procurements, I think BAA, I think that, again, the US government has lots of procurement instruments that allow it to, to implement agile programs, allow it to have real partnerships with its implementing partners instead of always treating them as a contractor that has to be held accountable and not really trusted. And if you have that sort of relationship, um, the idea of joint problem solving or, or information sharing or, or problem identification, the, the building blocks of agile development are not possible. Now, cooperative agreements could be used to allow for joint problem solving mm -hmm. and agile development and, um, and information sharing, but they're not because right now, all relationships with, with implementing partners, or virtually all, are treated as contract relationships. So you, that would be one tool. Okay. You also have design and deliver, so you can, mm -hmm. you can put focus on, on yes. design and, and, and code design programs. You've got the BAA, so there are instruments that exist. It's not, I think it's not a lack of instruments, it's a lack of the mindset, the training, and the orientation of, of staff around how to use those instruments. Okay. Car Carla, what do you? Uh, three quick points, and I think it relates both to the opportunity to be able to succeed notwithstanding the stovepiping that exists around earmarks and directives. Um, one is the way we track and report, and I think that there's a real need for us, or it's, there's a real need for foreign aid agencies and USAID in particular to increase the ability to dual report on more than one objective. And right mm -hmm. now we're really mm -hmm. constrained in our ability to track those resources mm -hmm. and say with real integrity, these are dollars that are going towards one primary objective but, have, but really are also going towards a secondary objective. Mm -hmm. And if we have those data and, data and systems, it really enables us much better to track an integrated program that's serving more than one objective. I think one area where there has been progress at AID and elsewhere is the use of innovative tools and techniques to facilitate coordination and collaboration. And the example that immediately comes to mind is um, the use of mapping uh, and mapping technology to track where project interventions in different sectors are taking place. And it's a very easy visual tool that enables different partner organizations to collaborate when they know they're working in, in, the, in, the, same, in the same places in, in the different same zip sectors. Code. And, mm -hmm. um, and I have a beautiful visual of when we did all the, brought together all the mapping exercises from around the world and they were in the lobby of the Reagan building and it really showed how you can work together if you share that information in a way that is very easy to digest and enables you to program your projects and your interventions yeah across all of the sectors in which they're working. So I think there's real opportunity for more innovation in that space that will facilitate coordination. And the third, I think, is, is something which Susan alluded to, which is the conversations around what kinds of interventions feed different types of outcomes. So one specific example I can give is the use of basic ed money to uh, undertake gender-based violence programming because we now know that gender-based violence and the threat of gender-based violence in schools is a very mm. real disincentive to school achievement. And we have had the conversations mm -hmm. to say, unless you eliminate the threat of gender-based violence, you're not gonna achieve the increases in enrollment and outcome for education. And that's been a conversation that's been welcomed and has enabled us to use funds labeled basic ed in ways that achieve the desired outcome, but you wouldn't have traditionally thought were basic education resource friendly. So I think those conversations mm -hmm. really build understanding and enable you to work around these directives in creative ways. Okay, so Don? So I think Patrick and Carla have really touched on most of the points I wanted to make, but uh, again, from the optimistic standpoint, I sometimes view earmarks as the cost of building a constituency for foreign aid. 
And this is very consistent with what mm -hmm. both uh, Diana and, and uh, Susan were saying. If $800 million for basic education is doable, we have to accept the fact that that's going to be a complication for USAID, for the implementers that we can deal with. Carla was brilliant in her role as the coordinator for gender of finding a gender component to anything you could imagine. And really, I mean, really spectacular in that. I remember once we were talking about building a dam. And we required a gender impact statement for that dam. And the country team in that country came back and said, 50% of the water used by the people uh, who are serviced by that dam will be women. And Carla went back and said, OK, that's interesting. How many uh, women are going to be involved in building that dam? So it's going to be primarily men. You're going to skew the labor market. Is the electricity that's produced going to go into households and therefore allow women not to have to cook with firewood? And therefore, we can address the problem of 2 million women who die each year mm. from respiratory illnesses because they breathe that smoke. What, how many people are going to be displaced by the construction of that dam? And what is that going to do to the gender dynamic? And the bottom line is we got to use some of our gender money in conjunction with that project. A, and you can do that right across the board. And I, I think it really uh, tells that this integrated development approach matters. You can say basic education, as Patrick was saying, is key to HIV prevention. It is also key to uh, uh, putting off marriage and child marriage. It's also key to income generation throughout your, your life. And I, I just don't see it as the serious problem that everyone else does. I think at AID, we had the capacity to use those earmarks effectively. And basically, there was a dialogue with people like Diana, with people like uh, you know, uh, Tim Reeser, with, uh, with our friends who truly care as much about development as we do. You know, Nita Lowy has been one of the heroes of child education and basic education around the world. And I will never condemn her for putting an earmark on that area. In terms of the, the other question that you've asked, uh, I, think, I think Susan really you know, hit, hit it on the head, which is if you've got contracting officers and you've got uh, implementing uh, officers for the NGOs or the development contractors who are actually talking to each other mm -hmm. and are saying back and forth, this is restricting our capability to actually achieve results. Can we do a project amendment? Can we put some money into an agreement that is relatively loose so that we can adapt it to the challenges that we face midstream? If we can get feedback loops, again, going where, you know, six months into a project, you say, oops, we got it wrong. And it's not just we, the implementer, who got it wrong. It's we, the person who developed the program. I also think that there has to be an expansion of a willingness at AID. And, and they are moving in this direction to accept uh, unsolicited proposals. Because frankly, in so many cases, you know, just because it wasn't invented at AID doesn't mean it's not a good development idea. Fair enough, and I, I understand what you mean by that. So, D Diana, you just heard this conversation about earmarks. So, is, is this, will, will this fly on Capitol Hill A and B? If this isn't going to fly on Capitol Hill, what arguments would fly on Capitol Hill to, to think more broadly about integrated development? Well, let me just say, I think we have to start by recognizing that the current system is one that's based on um, input orientation. So everything that's earmarked and everything that people are paying attention to is how much are we spending mm -hmm. and what areas, you know, it, it, it's all 
based on the beginning part of it. And we need to basically switch to a system that's outcomes-based budgeting. Mm -hmm. So that we're measuring, we're looking at what we achieve with the money instead of um, what, what, cat, what, what category we're buying it. But that's, you know, that's a long and difficult transition. I th it's something that, um, you It's like know, a think tank employment <laughs> program. It's great. <laughs> I'm all for it. Dan's loving it. I think it. it's He's great, great taking idea. notes on this saying, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> but the building the trust is going to be the really hard part because there's all these, this um, sense in there that USAID is always looking for a way to get out of doing what Congress wants them to do. And, you know, um, it makes sense that one program could really um, uh, fit two different earmarks. That it, it mm -hmm. you know, it could apply to, you know, Feed the Future and it could apply to family planning and it could mm -hmm. apply to education. But Congress gets crazy if you say you want to have one program count towards three things because they they think it's your way of getting out of the earmark requirement so uh, you know mm -hmm. rebuilding that trust is the hardest part um, i think it started um, usaid has so much better of a reputation now than it did five years ago or ten years ago when it was just you know kicked around as the you know well, I remember. <laughs> <laughs> we all remember Dan the bad old days. So, it's, so it's getting there, but it's, you know, it's <laughs> got to continue. It's been tough, right? <laughs> okay, so, so Susan, um, I, I'm listening to this conversation. I say, okay, technology helps. Uh, different kinds of contracting mechanisms help. Uh, capable, enlightened leadership and aid helps. Having folks on the ground who are in charge of kind of thinking differently about a problem mm -hmm. helps. I think. Some of the sorts of things that the administration's done, such as partnership for growth, I think speaks to sort of Absolutely. this idea of, of, of integrated development. I, the term integrated development isn't sort of necessarily spoken, but it's implicit in, in, that, in that approach. So you referenced maybe the potential for guidance, or is there a, so talk about what, what are the sorts of things from, from where you are that, that you think could, you could see happen that, that, that either that is happening now or you'd like to see more of that would, that would allow for integrated development to, to be more fully mainstream. I wouldn't say integrated because that's silly, but is it mainstreamed, <laughs> mainstreamed or, or more, right. more mainstreamed within the, the agency? Yeah, well, first, I think you've raised a great point. We're talking about integrated development mainly between the USAID family, if you will, and our partners and the donors. But, I mean, really, when we talk about integrated development, and Don discussed his 40th anniversary today is the 55th anniversary of Peace Corps, so all of you former volunteers, <laughs> the executive order going out today, we had a celebration mm. of uh, uh, RPCVs at uh, USAID mm. today. And I think, you know, it's recognition of the broader, um, the broader uh, development family, you know, that has been working on this from MCC to OPIC to, you know, across the interagency and PFG is a great example of that, mm -hmm. of where we mm -hmm. really tried using the presidential policy directive and global development, which I still think is, you know, a seminal, um, not only yeah. uh, policy, but really changed the way all of us uh, looked at development, approached it, and, and you know, raised an elevated development um, within the national security framework. So I think we have to look at it from you know, integrated development. It's all of us and, and broader, uh, as we've talked about. You know, internally within USAID, I guess why I'm so optimistic, because we have talked about this for some time as cross-sectoral, even mainstream development. But there is, you know, what I see in our officers and you know, our foreign service officers, 50% have less than five years in the agency. We just swore in another outstanding group last week of 45 Foreign Service officers. We're going to, you know, this year 150 will be coming on board. Carla wow. helped me this last year, 123 new Foreign Service officers. To them, uh, while they come in in technical backstops, uh, and I would say this is true for however you're working in development or with USAID, you know, it, again, it gets back to understanding we're not going to achieve our results unless we really look at it in an integrated, mm. sustainable way. So what are we doing internally? Uh, it is the guidance. It really is, you know, recognizing we need to be providing um, guidance to the field. And so I want to applaud particularly our DACHA, but there's a whole working group that's been working on this for some time, so um, pulling it forward. Two is training. Um, you know, it's mm. interesting getting back to the cylinders of excellence. We, last week, we had all the environmental officers in for the first time in 15 years. Mm. Um, and we've done that with you know, DRG officers. We've done it with health officers and whatnot. And there's always 
part of that training, and FHI 360 hosted it, so thank you. And a part of every single training of a backstop, we talk about integrated development, but one of the things we talk, we need to have integrated development training uh, just for uh, mm -hmm. all officers. I mean, I would love to make that part of our new Foreign Service Officer training that everyone really, mm -hmm. as they come in, is thinking about that. Third, I really do think that there is something um, to having a separate fund that is dedicated to this. I was really pleased to see, for example, with our biodiversity policy, and they just launched the Bridge Fund, which is essentially mm. um, biodiversity and resilience mm. and an integrated management and missions can buy into it. I think we have to provide resources to incentivize that. Um, and then lastly, it is this issue of being able to sit down, be really intentional, have the dialogue with the Hill, uh, because I think, as, as Diana said, we've uh, overcome a lot of obstacles over the last several years and, and with incredible leadership that really built, re rebuilt the relationship with the Hill. But in order for um, that trust to continue, because they want to do the right thing, they may care desperately, obviously, Congress Woman Lowy cares desperately about education, but as Carla pointed out, you know, we're actually going to get at these issues of GBV and education if we work together in so many ways. It's just more dialogue. Yeah. So. Great. All right, well, thanks. I think there's a lot of thoughtful people in this, this room. I want to hear from Dr. Nicole Golden, who's an affiliate here at CSIS. Thanks for being here, Dr. Golden, over there. I want to hear from Steve Mosley and this gentleman here in the red tie, these three. So we'll start with these three. We'll bunch these together. We'll do this World Bank style. OK, Dr. Golden. Great. Thank you. Thanks for a uh, great panel, great paper, Dan. Great to see so many family and friends and colleagues, colleagues, former colleagues. Picking up, Susan, on your last point about training, I'm sort of asking this question wearing my development educator hat, if you will, adjunct faculty at GW. How do you teach integrated mm. development? Right, if this mm -hmm. is going to be a longer term endeavor, you mm -hmm. talked about you know, the staff coming in are new, how do you teach integrated development? Can you teach it or do you just do it? Okay, mm -hmm. okay. we're gonna bunch these together. Amy, if you could get uh, Mr. Stephen Mosley over here and then this gentleman here. What a great panel and Dan, thank you very much. You're a treasure for the community to cause these things to happen on stage, it's really wonderful. Um, I wanna make a very brief comment because I spent about 10 to 15 years of my life maybe working on the well-being of certain kinds of earmarks. This community actually did something very interesting starting 15, almost 18 years ago, and that was to recognize that, that it wouldn't be good for foreign aid if we kept battling against each other in the process. And we came to realize that the pie had to grow in order for everybody to succeed on what we recognized then were the seeds that were necessary for integrated development if all of us were gonna make a worthwhile process on the Hill. And that's the outcome is interaction became more advocacy for integrated processes and fair play on the relationship with the Congress, the same with the new global leadership um, council or campaign. campaign. Um, we learned a lot from that, that um, yes, it didn't help to have somebody have an enormous earmark where people would be left out and it would result in bad development. So the community, I think, has had a very positive effect on the budget by collaborating together before we went to the Hill and caused disarray. And I, I hope that's continuing. Um, but I wanted to ask a question. One of the things you didn't talk about today about integrated development is something, I listened to the current president of the CAR, I'm glad you talked about your earlier experience in the Central African mm -hmm. Republic, but the woman who's about to end her presidency has established a new process of peace building as well as relating humanitarian assistance and development. Um, but what she emphasized was how important it was to start earlier to prevent conflict through investing in localized um, human development, localized crisis prevention through dialogue, and that the investment, perhaps under goal 16, could be greatly enhanced. I, there's no earmark for that now, and I'm not suggesting there ought to be one, but it's less than 1% of all foreign assistance in all agencies globally, not just here in the US, on peace building, not peacekeeping, peace building. So I wanted to ask you if you could comment about how you could see going forward an investment in the earlier process. You talked about the nice integration in human development, uh, humanitarian and development. But how do we start earlier? How do we find money? How do we make that effect, getting that silo integrated in a way that will have development follow? Thank you. Okay, and then this gentleman here. Thank you. Um, I'm John Coonrod with The Hunger Project. And, uh, wildly enthusiastic about this panel today. This is a very, very important issue. 
And one of the things that certainly we in our work found is critical for integrated development to uh, both succeed and be uh, sustainable is it's integrated with the local governance system, the sub-district community level governance, mm -hmm. um, which is often starved for resources, mm -hmm. starved for autonomy, starved for capacity. Uh, places like, you know, you mentioned Uganda and mm -hmm. Ethiopia, places with strong mm -hmm. local governance systems. So I'm wondering to what degree do you all see that um, really beefing up and strengthening that sub-district level governance of all of the services that a community counts on um, is critical to the success of this. Okay, so who wants to take what? Don, do you wanna? Well, I'll take, I'll take a couple of quick comments. Uh, on the question of teaching integrated development, I actually think that the new generation of foreign service officers gets this. I mean, the, the notion that you come into USAID or MCC to be a narrow focused, you know, water officer or what I think that's a thing of the past. And I think what we have to avoid doing is reinforcing those uh, notions. And mm -hmm. so I do like the idea in the A100 class of saying, you know, you are, you're not a generalist because you still have important skills to bear, but it's not just the gender coordinator who's got to look out for making sure that the project that you're involved with affects women. You know, at the State Department, all throughout the 70s, they went back and forth on, do you want generalists or do you want people who could, you know, focus on Latin America for their entire career or focus on nuclear disarmament? And I always thought that that was a false debate because you need both, and you need both in any individual as well. On the question of uh, whether, uh, Steve, could you reiterate your? Uh, excuse me, on, on the peace building front, I think we all recognize that the basic cause of conflict in situations does relate to poverty, it relates to ethnicity, it relates to past grievances, it relates to a lack of a political environment. I think in, in reality, there is nothing more integrated than watching a country fall apart because it doesn't have a proper rule of law or it doesn't have political uh, inclusion or the income distribution is awful. And so I think it feeds right into this notion. But I, one thing I would avoid doing, and we had to very carefully do this at USAID, not everything that you're doing is related to peace and conflict transformation. Because too frequently you try to fold everything under that because there's a real uh, constituency, and I would argue one point. I think there is a constituency for foreign aid, and I think that constituency increasingly is people who understand the link between global insecurity mm -hmm. and American national interests and development abroad. And I've made this point before. I think the American people finally get it that countries that are peaceful and prosperous and democratic don't tend to traffic in drugs, in mm. people, or in weapons. Amen. They don't send refugees flooding yep. across borders or oceans. They don't harbor terrorists. They don't harbor pirates. They don't transmit pandemic diseases. It's true. And they don't require American troops on the ground. And if we can make that communication mm -hmm. so clear, the link between American national security, not just American economic security, not just an extension of American values abroad, but that tight link between national security and development assistance, then I think we're going to be fine. Come on, yeah. comment. Patrick. So uh, Don and Steve's comments bring us back to Carla's opening statement about fragility and, and being able to design and execute programs in fragile um, contexts. And uh, 
there's a clear indication from our government and from other governments that that's where they want to focus future assistance because that's where the needs are the greatest. To work in those areas will, I believe, will drive um, more integrated approaches and it will force us to learn how to do it and to learn how to use the instruments and work within the earmarks to address things in more integrated ways because that context requires it. You're not going to be effective or, or really be able to operate in that context unless you um, are taking a, a more multifaceted mm -hmm. approach. And that also gets to your question, John, about local governments because working in those environments brings you down to the local level. And it, 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 for me, it's almost a chicken and the egg sort of thing. If yeah. you're gonna do integrated development programs, then almost by definition, you're, you have to engage at the local level. And if you're gonna engage at the local level, it's going to pull you towards more integrated approaches. Hey, Diane and Susan. Yeah, I just wanted to respond real quickly to um, something Steve said, and it also ties into John's question. I think you're right, Steve, that over the past 10 years or so, the NGO community has been much better about, instead of you know, fighting with each other for the you know, scraps and crumbs of the pie, of working together to uh, promote a larger overall international affairs budget. But I think you know, we've seen you know, the international affairs budgets kind of flatten out. It doesn't look like it's going to have any major expansion anytime soon. Yeah. And I, I think it's important for people to recognize that at a very fundamental level, there is a conflict between country ownership and earmarks. The more that we do decide here in Washington how much should be spent for a particular purpose or a particular sector, the less flexibility there is at the country level for people in that country, including our mm -hmm. aid mission, to see what is actually needed there. What, and, you know, what is there the capacity to do? What are the needs? What are the priorities? If you set them here, you can't set them there. Amen, exactly. Susan. Just the last thing I was going to use as an example, and uh, getting back to Nicole's point of teaching, you know, I think case studies are the best way, and the best case studies I've found, John, are really at the local level, where we've seen integrated development really move the needle, and we can give lots of examples, but my last post in Colombia, it was really when we went to the heart of uh, the coca growing region, where the FARC uh, was born, and we chose the municipalities, and not just we, USAID, it was the entire, most importantly, the Colombians who led the way and we used all of our tools uh, in the US government and the donor community in order to help them take those territories back in an integrated way. So there's a difference between, co because coordination means you're all kind of swirling around each other. Integrating means you're really sequencing your interventions, mm -hmm. you're listening to the community, you're responding, you're being flexible mm -hmm. and agile. Mm -hmm. Carl, do you want to comment on any of this? No. It's okay. okay. No. Good. All right. So, Mike, <laughs> my, no, not good. No. Good from a time efficiency okay, standpoint. Good from a time efficiency. Mike, uh, this gentleman, and this woman here. Yep. Mike, Mike Cass, start with Mike Cass. Thank you, Dan, and thanks to the panel for this. Uh, we, we tend to talk about this about ourselves. And it's not about us, it's about them. Mm -hmm. I wanted to go to a broader point. Back when Don was starting, mm -hmm. most of the money that was going to these countries came from the U.S. government Absolutely. and from USAID. Let's be honest about it. Today, 27% of it comes from governments in general. Yeah. And most of it comes from FDI, foreign direct investment, large private donors, and from remittances. Mm -hmm. In 2008, a billion dollars, a billion, went into Somalia. We have no control over that. We have no visibility on it. But when you talk about integrating, Susan, we have to be mindful of that. Mm -hmm. We're not coordinating with the That's Gates. That's right. Mm -hmm. we're not, we're, they, they don't want to coordinate. Mm -hmm. neither, the, neither do these people who are putting the FDI in there. Mm -hmm. But yet we ignore, you know, 70% of what goes into these countries, and mm -hmm. we think it's all about us. Mm -hmm. And it's not. And if we're going to improve, okay. if you really want to integrate, I think we have to go to a larger scale, if you could comment on that. Mm -hmm. Okay. This gentleman here, and I'll, I'll, I want to come back to that. It's good. 
Thank you. Uh, this has been a great presentation. Uh, I'm Jim Tarrant of the Bridge Project, which Councillor Reichley mentioned briefly. Uh, Bridge is an attempt to integrate biodiversity conservation to other key development sectors. Um, and one of the interesting things about it is that biodiversity conservation, biodiversity has no natural constituency. Biodiversity simply means the variability of nature, briefly. What does have a constituency are <laughs> one of the products of biodiversity, which is ecosystem systems, goods and services, clean water, food, fiber, fodder, uh, uh, the pollination and, and other things like this. So what's interesting about the challenge we face is not only to identify how concrete aspects of biodiversity help human well-being and development, but learning how to do so. And one of the things that's really useful about PPL, the existence of PPL, is the focus on learning. And I can't say enough that there needs to be more systematic learning across sectors, and to do so in a way that's both creative and innovative. Our project is one of several of, of similar types of projects that are trying to do that, and the agency will be, benefit, I think, from it. Okay, thank you. <coughs> you this, this woman here in the blue sweater. Hello, uh, my name is Sandra Sham, and I'm in the Department of Anthropology at Catholic University. Mm. And uh, I worked at U USAID for about six years. I was a AAAS fellow there. Mm. And um, uh, a lot of what we did in the Asian Middle East bureaus, a lot of the programs we did had a civil military component. And I, it wasn't something I heard anybody talk about at any length. And I was just wondering how this sort of thing fit into the whole concept of integrated development. Thank you. So, Carla, maybe I'll start with you if you want to respond. It's just because you're feeling guilty. Because I'm feeling very guilty, <laughs> yes. Very guilty. Um, I think that, so first of all, I think your point is a really great one. And I think there's even another component. I was recently in Nepal, and, um, and I was talking with some of the non-governmental organizations on the ground. And they said also that crowdsourced funding in response to humanitarian disasters is mm -hmm. enormous and vastly oh, outstrips absolutely. many of the call the centralized calls to the UN system for that aid and it's not coordinated at all. I think what it basically speaks to is a need to allow local partners to lead because and enable them to lead and help us with the coordination and the integration because at the end of the day all spigots lead to uh, the partners and beneficiaries on the ground and they're the ones that can help us uh, speak to how we coordinate and integrate writ large and um, and then I just wanted to pick up on the last one to say, I think the last set of questions to say that I think there are two additional equations that play into this issue of prevention and how you move forward. One is around um, how you factor fragility into your planning and project design. And then the second is how you uh, look at resilience as an outcome always. And if you do that, mm -hmm. then your pre prevention is built into the way you're, you're structuring your projects to move forward. I think the civil military yeah. question really relates to, in part, the, the multiple actors on the ground and how you move that agenda forward. And I think there's enormous scope for improvement. And in fact, one of the discussions I was recently having was around how there was improved civil military coordination in light of play, the work we had done around places like Afghanistan and Iraq and that we risk pulling back from that coordination and collaboration because we mm -hmm. are not working as intensively mm -hmm. in those environments. So I think there's a real actual risk of moving backwards yeah. where we've made progress over the last decade. Let me just jump in on this question that Mike put on the table about uh, resources that change resource environment. Uh, our bumper sticker here is we have to think of foreign assistance as not the largest wallet in the room where the the most catalytic wallet in the room. I think that's what we have to think differently. I think there is a role for foreign assistance, and uh, even in this changed environment, everything that you've said is true. I think if you have trouble sleeping at night, we have a report on domestic resource mobilization I want you to read, but actually is pretty important. It was a bestseller before Addis Ababa, but it was actually, it's actually very important. If you look at some of the statistics about the amount of money collected by developing countries in terms of taxes and tax systems, uh, it's very, very important. It's much larger. It's even, even in Africa, it's increased five-fold in the last 15 years. So there are an increasing number of countries that are going to be able to pay for their own development. We hosted the planning minister of Pakistan here uh, on Friday, and it's clear they have, you know, they're, 
you know, they, they are thinking, they have resources of their own. I think obviously there's also domestic right. savings and local capital markets. There's just been an increase in that. Mm -hmm. So these are dwarf all foreign assistance are, are going to dwarf it. We are also doing some work with the European Development Finance in, in, uh, Association. So this is the OPICs of Europe, of which it's a similar, there are various alphabet soup organizations who like OPIC and AID have a, there's a DFI and there's an aid agency and they're being asked to do a lot more because of this changing environment as well. So when we think about integrated development, I think we have to think about the military. I think we have to think about how governments themselves are, are, are in a different place in many instances. We have to think about DFIs. We have to think about you know, whether mm -hmm. organizations, specialized organizations like MCC and how they're thinking about this as well as aid. So I, I take your point and it, it opens up a larger discussion about what's our role and how we, how we think about ourselves. And I think integrated development is, is part of that. So can, can I just yes. make a comment on that, which is, Ultimately, with this changing environment, both resource environment and other cha changing in, in the political environment, we're talking about how do we use our funds in the most strategic manner. And what we're advocating for and what we're seeing based on the evidence, and there is a, pretty, there is a growing evidence base mm -hmm. for this, is that integrated approaches are a strategic use of funds. Yeah, Don. So just to put some numbers on what you've just said, and I used to give this speech a lot, uh, the U.S. government, uh, and this is a few years old, but essentially provides $35 billion worth of development assistance. Private Americans, through NGOs, through church groups, et cetera, gave $45 billion. Mm. You had $300 billion from remittances going to developing countries. You had a trillion dollars worth of private investment. And the number that you're looking for is seven trillion dollars yeah, worth trillion. of domestic resource mobilization yeah. in these countries. And so I always used to have, you know, development contractors or NGOs come in and say, we don't get why you're doing this 30% you know, deal. And I said, you're missing the boat. If you want to get involved in the health uh, sector in Cote d'Ivoire, why are you fighting over the $20 million that AID is putting in there when they have $2 billion worth of yeah. resources that they put into their health sector? And so if you can get in there and help them use those resources far more effectively, the multiplication factors are remarkable. And in terms of the private sector, I think we all know that they're getting very savvy now. It isn't just corporate social responsibility. It is their business model. And so to link up with Coca-Cola to do water projects in West Africa, to use Coca-Cola distribution systems mm -hmm. to get yeah. Ringer's lactate mm -hmm. throughout Haiti, so that because you, know, you can get a Coca -Cola, cold Coca-Cola any place in Haiti, but you can't get you know yeah, right. medicines into those areas. And so when cholera hit, we went straight to Coca-Cola and said, "Could you just put you know Ringer's lactate and these other things on your trucks and get it all around mm -hmm. the country?" It was the key to solving the situation there. I, I'm going to yeah. bet Don. Sorry to interrupt, Don, Please. but I think both okay. World Learning and FHI 360, in the, if they're not already working with host country governments as Partners, to, to, they will. They certainly will oh, be absolutely. in the near future. I bet is the future. if it's not if it's not twenty percent of your business or ten percent of business, it will be, or thirty percent. The one thing I would add, though, there is that you have to have a government that you believe truly reflects the will of the people. It, yes. Because if I do not yeah. want to work with authoritarian governments who define their own priorities for the populations. Fortunately, if we all read Steve Ratlett's book. We know that democracy is, is you know, flooding, his, especially at the local level. You know, his paper, his paper on emerging Africa talked about well, what are the success, the five points of successful African countries. One was about democratic governance, so it matters. It really does matter. Does that is that your case at FHI three sixty? Yeah, we you, do. You have you have, you have yeah. clients who are host country yeah. governments, but it's hard. I mean, those are harder clients to work with. You've got a much higher level of risk. Much lower NICRA levels too. It's, 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 <laughs> <laughs> Not necessarily, <laughs> but, but there is a much higher level of risk that, that the organization yeah. takes on when it gets into those relationships. So just an organization I know of, Pan American Development Foundation, very well run, has done a lot of work on Plan Columbia, 
uh, has $90 million last year in revenue. How much of it was from the government of Columbia? $60 million. Yep. $60 million from the government of Columbia. And that was mm -hmm. building on the work that when, mm -hmm. you know, it, 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 with AID, the, the Columbia government said, you know, I've got enough, I've got, I'm collecting enough taxes now and I'm in a place now, mm -hmm. I actually, I want to buy that. I, mm -hmm. I, I want that. Mm -hmm. so, so I think, you know, I think you're going to, and I don't think, they don't think in terms of earmarks. So mm -hmm. <laughs> the Columbia government said, I just want, I want, a, I want a different kind of an outcome. I want to, I want to win the, I want to consolidate the peace in Columbia. That's my outcome. It's not, you know, and so there are, there are submetrics beyond, or the, but my outcome is I want to consolidate the peace in Columbia. And so, so I think what you're seeing with PADF or FFHA 360 or World Learning, I think you're going to see a lot more of that. And I do think these sorts of integrated approaches, I think those kind of clients are, don't think in terms of the 150 account or, or earmarks. They think in terms of sort of, and hopefully they're responding to mm -hmm. Account, they're accountable governments responding to their to their to their polities, if I can put it that way. And that's real country ownership. And that and that is real country ownership. That is real country ownership. And it's unique. And yeah. exactly. exactly. <laughs> so, 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 Diane, do you want to respond to some of the things that have been put on the table here? Uh, I don't want to make okay. us go over. So, so Susan, I uh, just want to ask you just re just. Take a minute to, on the Civ Mill point, yeah. if you could come back to that. Yeah, because I, I, I'm so glad that you raised that point. I don't think we gave enough examples of that today, and yet the world we live in, and particularly working in conflict-affected states, and as, as Carla framed for us in the beginning, obviously we have more of them rather than less of them. The Civ Mill component is absolutely fundamental, and not just on the U.S. side. I would really would say on the international side and getting to the issue of peacekeeping, peace building, and uh, most importantly, working with the host countries. Uh, you know, Colombia sort of being the poster child for that, but I ho really hope that we have more examples of that as we move forward. Okay, it's great uh, working with people I like and admire. It's really easy to be on a panel of people who are so smart and experienced, and so please join me in thanking the panel, and I thank you again to FHI 360.